Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship here at the Reformed Church of Bronxville. It is so good to be together to worship this morning. And I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us via the live stream. It is good to gather together wherever you find yourself this morning. As a call to worship, hear these words from Psalm 77. I cry aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Amen. Let's continue our call to worship by reading the opening litany printed in your bulletin. You, my friends, can take the parts in bold. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now rise if you are able and join us in singing hymn number 388. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then we may respond to your gracious promises 
with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We now have the time in worship where we have the opportunity to go to God in confession. And when we offer our confessions to God, we enter into the beautiful work that we call reconciliation. And, and the work of reconciliation begins with rec reconciling ourselves with God, acknowledging uh, the ways in which we've fallen short in loving God and loving others this week. So trusting in our partner of grace, let us make our confession first together by reading the printed prayer of confession in your bulletin, and then we'll leave some space for silent confessions at the end. Let's pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we do not love you fully. You call, but we do not always listen. We neglect neighbors in need, fail to care for your creation, and do not do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Hear the good news from Romans. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. may be seated and if there's any children in the house today we would love to invite you up for a chancel talk so if there's any kids I see a couple oh we might have a really small chancel talk that's okay come on up anybody else hi come on up hi Hayden I see you Oh, we're going. Can you guys come? Can you come a little closer? Okay, a chancel talk of two. This is beautiful. Good morning, my friends. How are you? Good. Uh, my name is Pastor Christian. What's your name? Ella. Ella, and this is Hayden. How are you? Good. Uh, okay, Ella and Hayden, I have a question for you this morning. Do you have anyone in your life? that you admire or look up to? No, I guess so. Ella says her sister. And Hayden, what did you say? Um, uh, sister. Uh, your sister. OK, that is great. Anybody else you can think of? Not really. Not really? OK, that's good. That's good. Well, it's good to have people in our life that we admire and that we look up to, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in the church, we have a word for people like that. There are people in the church who we look up to and we admire, and we call them mentors. Have you ever heard of a mentor? Has anyone out here in this church ever heard of the word the, a mentor? OK. So a mentor is someone who maybe is just a little bit further down the road in life than you are, 
And then what they want to do is help you, give you advice, and pray for you and care for you to help you as you get older in life. That's a, that's a nice thing. It's a mentor. Okay, look out to this congregation. Look out to these people at Quick Sec. Guess what? In this church, there's a bunch of mentors. A bunch of them. They might be your church school teacher. They might have helped you in nursery. Someday they'll be your youth leaders. Yes, even your pastors can be mentors. That's pretty special. So, did you know that today Pastor Sam is going to talk about a very special mentorship relationship in the Bible? Look at this. I got pictures. You see this guy? You see this guy? This guy's name is Elijah. Can you say Elijah? Elijah. Elijah was what we call a prophet from God. What that means is God would tell Elijah special messages to, to, for Elijah than to tell God's people. And he would even give him powers to do miraculous works. So God and Elijah here were working together. Isn't that amazing? Guess what this guy's name is? This is a little confusing. You have a guess? No, this is not God. God is, is not specifically pictured in this, although he's all around us. This guy's name, this is Elijah. This is Elisha. Can you say Elisha? Elisha. Now, two friends, Elijah and Elisha, that probably got confusing for other people every now and again, didn't it? So Elijah was a prophet from God, and he was mentoring Elisha on how to become a prophet too. He was te- Elijah was teaching Elisha everything he knows. And then, guess what happened? One day, God decided, hey Elijah, I've got a whole new assignment for you up in heaven. And so he sent down, take a look, he sent down a chariot of horses and he scooped up Elijah. But before he went, he got to say goodbye to his, the person he was mentoring, Elisha. And he said, Elisha, what can I do to help you before I go? God's got a new mission for me in heaven. And Elisha said, could you just give me double the spirit that you had? So Elisha said, I want to continue doing the work that you did, but double the work that you were doing with God. And he granted him that. And guess what Elijah did? He left him. Can you see this picture? Elijah gave Elisha his cloak. His cloak. And then Elijah continued the work with God that Elijah was doing as a prophet on earth. Isn't that interesting? Now, remember when I pointed to you these mentors out here? Maybe your church school teachers and your nursery people. They might someday be your confirmation mentor, older siblings. Well, just in the same way that Elijah passed on his work to Elisha by handing him this cloak, well, we hope to do that with you two someday. That's right. Someday we want you two to be mentors to kids just like you now and to be church school teachers and confirmation mentors and youth leaders even. And maybe even someday Pastor Christian here could take this stool and just like Elijah passed it on to Elisha, maybe I might pass this on to you. What would you think about that? (laughs) A little intimidating. (laughs) Okay, my friends, so continue on as you are mentored now and just know that we want to encourage you and to build you up so that someday you too can be mentors to others as well. All right, let me pray for you and then you can go back to your seat, okay? Dear God, thank you so much uh, for these disciples. Thank you for the ways that they are growing in faith. Thank you for a church that supports them with mentors and teachers and nursery workers and people who care about their spiritual faith and growth. God, may they continue to grow up in the faith and then them one day to take the mantle and to be mentors to those uh, younger than them. In your name we pray. All God's people say, amen. Okay, you can take your seat. going to call Arlene Thomas forward to read our scripture this morning, and as she makes her way up, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer, a prayer of illumination. And this prayer is by Howard Thurman. 
O God, open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the second chapter of 2 Kings, verses 1 through 14. The scene takes place about 900 years before Christ and focuses on two prophets, Elijah and his disciple Elisha. If you'd like to follow along, you can find it on page 290 of your Pew Bible. Hear the word of God. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know, keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other, and the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? And Elisha said, please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. If not, it will not. And as they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and cried out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. He said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where is he? He struck the water again and the water was parted to the one side and to the other and Elisha crossed over. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. It's so good to be here with you this morning at our final 1030 service of the season. Note that next week we will be embarking on our summer schedule. So 10 a.m. next week, one service. I'll remind you again before the day's out so you don't forget. Uh, just a note that Pastor Matt is away on a much needed and welcomed vacation with his family to the Midwest, but he is praying for us, know that. Friends, my topic today is called Trust and Take Up Your Mantle. Please join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, 
our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, many of you probably know a week before yesterday, 126 seniors at Bronxville High School dressed up in their elegant white tuxedos and gowns and took part in the school's 100th graduation ceremony. I think graduation ceremonies are always special and filled with emotion because they clearly mark the end of a journey and the beginning of a new chapter a chapter that has not yet been written. Graduations are often called commencements to emphasize those new beginnings. And the beginnings and the endings are not just for the graduates themselves, but for their parents and their families and teachers and friends and everyone who knows and loves and cares for those students. I think graduations are a time for everyone to consider new possibilities and responsibilities and perhaps to accept that it's time to let go of some things that were hoped for and not realized. For those of us who are older, maybe you'll agree with me that as life goes on, we realize that there are less and less clearly defined life benchmarks, but they're there if we look closely for them. Today and next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching about Elisha, that prophet who lived almost 900 years before Jesus was born. I think we can learn some things from his story, especially when it comes to claiming or living into our identity or our calling. Now, as you might have heard from today's reading, and that was so beautifully done, Arlene, thank you, a long reading to do. Perhaps you heard in there that Elisha experienced his own kind of graduation in growing from student to prophet. His story is linked with another prophet, Elijah, as Christian talked to the kids about. And you can read about both Elijah and Elisha in 1st and 2nd Kings that tells all about the rulers of Judah and Israel both good and bad, from the end of King David's life, around 900 BC, all the way to 586 BC and the destruction of Jerusalem when the Babylonian Empire swept in. But let me give you a little backstory about Elijah and Elisha. Now, Elijah comes on the scene during the reign of King Ahab around the year 870 BC. Now Ahab and his wife Jezebel were called evil in the sight of the Lord because they worshiped gods other than the God of the Hebrew people, Jehovah. Specifically, they worshiped a God named Baal, B-A-A-L, who was a particularly nasty weather God. So Elijah goes up against this power couple. And after Elijah defeats what are called the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, he flees south to a cave on Mount Horeb, where he famously hears God's voice, not in the wind, or not in the earthquake, or not in a fire, but in sheer silence. Some of you might remember this passage. And in that silence... God tells Elijah, among other things, that he should anoint Elisha, who he's never met, as his future replacement. So Elijah hits the road again and eventually finds this young man, Elisha, who at the time is tending to his father's oxen. And Elijah throws his mantle over him temporarily. It's a marker of who Elisha will become. And I should mention here that a mantle is really a a kind of a cloak made of fur. So like those high school graduates who were fitted for their tuxes and their gowns before their graduation last week, Elisha briefly wore the cloak or the mantle of the prophet that he would become when the time was right. 
Friends, I think sometimes we choose our identity, but most often our identity is chosen for us. And we might not know it right away because it takes time to grow into it. Elisha most likely did not know what was later in store for him when he briefly wore Elijah's mantle as a boy. As that fur rubbed against his skin, could Elisha have known that later in life he would miraculously purify a spring of water or feed 100 people with just a few loaves of bread or even raise a boy from the dead? Did that mantle that Elisha wore as a boy fire his imagination? Friends, as we celebrate LGBTQ Pride Month and today Pride Sunday, I've been thinking of the tennis great Billie Jean King, who just on June 3rd was awarded the French Legion of Honor on the 50th anniversary of her French Open Championship. Some of you know her story. As a girl, Billie Jean King was a gifted softball player. Did you know that? A softball player. And in fact, her brother, Randy Moffat, became a major league player who pitched for 12 years professionally. But after Billie Jean King's parents said she should play a more ladylike sport, she chose tennis. And when she bought her first racket at age 11 for $8, with money that she saved herself, I wonder if King imagined the tennis player that she would become. Ranked number one in the world with six Wimbledon and four US Open championships among many other accomplishments. Did she, did she have a glimpse of what her future would be? Probably not. But maybe in her case, and let me explain why. The story goes that when King was a teenager, the minister at her Methodist church, who was himself a a two-time Olympic pole vaulting champion, he asked her, what are you going to do with your life? And she responded, Reverend, I'm going to be the best tennis player in the world. Maybe she realized that that $8 racket that she bought with her own money was a kind of mantle for her, inviting her into a calling. Now, it took a little longer for Elisha to act on his call, but eventually he did, and not without a struggle. Today's passage tells us that Elijah is traveling from the town of Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho and then to the bank of the Jordan River. Now, at each one of these stops, Elijah tells Elisha to stay behind. Now, we don't know why. It's not explained. But each time Elijah says for him to stay behind, Elisha says, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. And also at each stop, A group of prophets says to Elisha, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from you? And Elisha tells them, Yes, I know. Keep silent. And he follows Elijah anyway. How might Elijah, excuse me, how might Elisha have been feeling at that moment? with his master telling him not to follow him, and a group of men telling him that Elijah would be taken away that very day, his beloved mentor taken away that very day, did Elisha have a sense of foreboding, fear, curiosity? Now long ago when Elisha was tending his father's oxen, he had briefly worn Elijah's mantle, his cloak. What would happen when Elijah, his mentor, was gone? Then something astonishing happens. 
Elijah and Elisha reach the bank of the Jordan River with dark water blocking their path. And Elijah removes his mantle and he rolls it up and he strikes the water with it and then the waters part just as the Red Sea had once parted and just as the Jordan River itself had parted centuries before when the Hebrew people had crossed through it to get to the promised land. Elijah and Elisha pass between walls of water on each side. It's like a birth. Elijah has one final question for his student when they reach the other side. Elijah says to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha says strangely, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Now, what does that mean? Now, in that culture, a double share is the inheritance of a firstborn son. So when Elisha asks this question of Elijah, it's suggesting that he's Elijah's very child. Not just a mentor, but a child figure. And then as they continue to walk after this conversation, a chariot of fire and horses of fire race by and Elijah rises in a whirlwind up to heaven. Amazing scene. I can imagine the silence after Elijah vanishes. Maybe it's a silence like Elijah had experienced on Mount Horeb when he heard the voice of God. Elisha stares at the sky. He realizes his master is gone forever. He bows his head and then he tears his clothes in grief and then he sees Elijah's mantle lying on the ground and he, and he picks it up. Maybe it's still soaked with water from the first time around and he strikes the water with it and nothing happens. And then Elisha shouts, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And he strikes the water again and this time the river parts and he crosses back to the other side into his future into the chapter that had not yet been written. Friends, to me, this is a very human, very real experience of call. I think sometimes we seem like we just don't experience anything from God. Or maybe we experience a, a glimmer like Elisha briefly wearing Elijah's mantle as a child, but then time goes by, maybe years, Maybe years sitting at the feet of teacher after teacher, or no teacher at all, just sitting there alone, and nothing emerges. And then we cry out to God, maybe in frustration or resignation, and then one day we see a mantle on the ground and the waters part. Friends, I think the truth is we wear different mantles at different times in our lives and our life experiences direct our attention to what those mantles mean, what those new callings might be inviting us to. Elisha's experience wearing Elijah's mantle as a child was very different than his experience in taking it up after Elijah, his mentor, had vanished. Friends, we can only tell this by telling our own stories, our stories which are uniquely our stories. And friends, this brings me to thoughts about Friday's landmark Supreme Court decision, which as your pastor, I feel I must share. First, let me state the obvious. <laughs> I'm not a legislator. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist. I'm also not a woman. I am a male pastor, bound by my own experience and guided by scripture, church teaching, 
and ethical reasoning, who believes fervently in the sanctity of all life and a woman's right to privately make her own informed decisions about her health. Now, I know that these do not always fit together neatly. And we all know that life is not neat, even as some try to make it so with unnuanced positions or callous sound bites. In my years as a pastor, and even before, I have walked with several women and men who have struggled with heart-wrenching decisions regarding this issue. None entered into it lightly. And those who discerned did so with great sadness due to their particular circumstances in their lives. Friends, one thing I have learned regarding this and other matters is the healing power of sharing our stories. <coughs> our stories are ours. Our stories are uniquely ours, even if they are difficult to tell. The Bible itself is a series of stories about God's great love for us and God's great forgiveness. It is not a guidebook to modern medical science, which continues to evolve at a dizzying speed. I regret and grieve in this time of heightened emotion and political division that many are afraid to share their stories for fear of judgment and retribution. Friends, I firmly believe that as a society, we need to reach a place where we can speak with one another with respect and compassion, even if we disagree. I pray that our churches and this church can be a safe place to do that. And in sharing our stories with vulnerability, we can come to new understandings about God and ourselves. And we can do it together, friends with love. In closing, let us remember these amazing words from Romans chapter 8 as we grapple with the profound questions of our lives. Paul wrote this, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Friends, in our victories and in our losses, in our struggles and in our decisions, as we pick up our mantles and continue to look for them, have faith. Have faith and trust God and know that, paraphrasing that great pastor, Frederick Buechner, that the worst thing is not the last thing. New life and new love awaits us all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite Christian to come forward, and all of our youth who might be here who are going to Colorado for an amazing trip, and I'll turn it over to Christian. <laughs> yeah, come on up, hikers. In two days, we will be awaiting to board a plane to Denver, to embark on an amazing journey, experiencing God in nature. Yeah, come up to this, uh, yeah, that step right there. Great. Uh, to experience God in nature, to grow together uh, as a group, and to grow closer to God uh, just through backpacking, whitewater rafting, and experiencing the mighty force of nature. And I got to do this trip when I was these guys' age, and it completely changed my relationship with the natural world, and it taught me how to connect with God in a brand new way. And so our hope is that these students would return back here to all of us uh, new people, uh, changed, uh, uh, not only with a greater appreciation of what God has created, but also with a new way, a new way to experience our faith together. So thank you, congregation and church, for your prayers and support for us as we've gotten ready to go. And Pastor Sam's going to say a blessing over us, so I'm going to come join you over here. That's right. I'm going to come right down here. 
And I'm going to invite those of you who are here to stand as you are able. It is traditional when folks go on a journey to lay on hands. So I invite you to join me in a symbolic laying on of hands that we can send these folks off in a great way. So will you raise your, your right hand and we pray to God that you will get to Colorado safely have an amazing time enjoying God's creation, and may you return transformed with bigger hearts and bigger minds, eager to share your experiences with all of us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace and traveling mercies. Can we give them a hand? For Friends, I only have two announcements other than to say thank you for all of your giving throughout the church year, for the giving of your time, your energy, your financial resources. They mean so much to the life of this church. We're going to be taking an offering in just a moment. If you'd like to fulfill your pledge or throw in a little extra into the plate, know that you are going to be changing lives through your donations. Again, just wanted to remind you that this is our last 1030 service of the program year. Next Sunday, we will be at our summer schedule, which is 10 a.m. And we will, can I hear you say that back to me? 10 a.m.? Okay, tell your friends. Make sure everyone gets here on time. And that summer schedule is going to continue through Labor Day weekend. And finally, just know that all of you are invited for a time of refreshment and fellowship in the Edwards Room through these doors on your right-hand side. And what am I forgetting? Oh, please share the peace of Christ with those around you before we take the offering. <laughs> the offering will now be received.
Gracious God, every perfect gift comes from your hand. So accept these gifts as an offering ourselves, thanking you for everything that you've done in our lives. Bless them and multiply them that they might help this church open its doors ever wider, touching lives in Bronxville and beyond. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Before we join together in a closing prayer, I've just been told that coffee hour is in the narthex today and not the Edwards room, so my apologies. Grab a cup of coffee where you can. I'll ask you to join with me in prayer, and there will be times in the prayer when I will say, Lord, have mercy, and if you could repeat, hear our prayer. So let's pray together. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in his name. So as we sit here in stillness, knowing through all the changes of life that you are our God, we offer our prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide, that, united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, guide the rulers of the nations. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us the will to reorder our lives that all may have their rightful share of food, medical care, and shelter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, restore among us a love of the earth you created for our home. Give us respect for all your creatures that living in harmony with everything you have made, your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Erase prejudices that oppress, free us from crime and violence, Protect all those working for the common good and give all citizens a new vision of life of harmony. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Look with compassion on all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Support with your love those who are ill, those who are grieving, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. God, as you have moved toward us in love, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we pray now for all in our community for whom prayers have been asked by first name, including Muriel and Karen, Nancy, Jem, Jace, Bob, Dan, Beryl, Alice, Joanna, Kevin, Karen, David, Violet, Murdoch, Michelle, Heather, Lucy, Arlene, Bob, Brad, John, Lamars, Ida, and Gregory. And God, we ask that you comfort the friends and families of the following individuals who have died recently, including Avis Bryan, Kitty Buttigieg, Edward Higgins, Harry T. Barr, Carl Hay, Dee Sorensen, Joan Keeley, and Mary Wideline. God, we take a moment now with silence to lift up in our hearts any other person or situation we're thinking about this morning. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And please rise again as you are able and let's sing our closing hymn, which is printed in your bulletin. Friends, as you have come here to worship, go now to serve. And as you do, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.